Welcome to Outback Outdoors. Make sure you like, subscribe, and click the alert to stay up to date on all our new videos. Hey, welcome. Today's show, we're going to go, we're going to do a public land mule deer hunting seminar. I'm here at the Denver ISE show. It's exciting stuff. I'm going to talk about the do's and don'ts of public land mule deer hunting. My name is Trevin Stolzfus. Scott Watley will probably be over here shortly. I'm getting started early because I actually, this is a long seminar and I'm always chopping it up because there's a lot to share. This is one of the most info cram seminars I do because there's so many factors. Like Thursday, I did a seminar on elk hunting and understanding how to read wind to help you to be successful hunting elk. Any fly fishermen in here? You read a river, right? Well, that's how you read wind. Because wind doesn't flow straight, it flows around and through, right? So we talked about that, it was great, but it's shorter, I'm just talking about wind. This is talking about hunting in a general sense, right? So, a little bit about myself. I was born in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I thought I was Mexican until I was 11. My family's still there. I love the state of New Mexico. I love the culture. I love the people. But I've been in Colorado for 20 years. So I'm not a native, but I'm a transplant. When I moved to Colorado, I had grown up. My, my, my dad did not hunt. But my grandpa and my uncles did. So they kind of took me under their wing and took me out and started quail hunting and fishing and then it went on to deer hunting and stuff. So that's how I got my start in the industry was being a kid who fell in love with hunting through someone other than their dad. Okay, and then I, I was always a good writer about things I liked. I wasn't a good writer about some book I read that I had to read in English, but it taught me, I, I learned to write well. And, and so when I moved to Colorado, I was blown away by the fact that within an hour of my house in Windsor, Colorado, I could see mule deer, moose, mountain goats, sheep, you know, and the list goes on and on and on. And so I started writing about my experiences with scouting and hunting using maps. Now this was before we had phones. I know I don't look that old, but I'm 52, I'm old. I feel old, um, but you guys remember when you used to read a paper map? Well, that's all I had, right, when I was a kid in New Mexico. So you'd look at the map, you'd look at your elevation. So I started writing about that. And at that same time, the digital mapping was starting to come up. More BLM, satellite imagery, and I was learning how to utilize that. Onyx wasn't around. They became what I had envisioned. No, no help of me, of course, but I mean, I knew that that was where it was going to go. Um, so I met a gentleman named Mike Eastman, Eastman's Hunting Journal, and I, he, he gave me the privilege of writing an article in his uh, book called Elk Hunting the West, uh, the Eastman Way, about this new fangled digital mapping, because I had gotten into that. And that's how I got my start in the industry. And then he, and they invited me to be their first research editor. This was in the early 2000s. And then um, I got a chance to, I fell in love with running a camera. I was a, a gentleman, anyone know who Cameron Haynes is? Okay, so I was one of Cameron Haynes' cameramen. And that is not a fun job. If you know who Cameron Haynes is, I was a, I was a college wrestler. I thought I was in shape. Funny story. And I take a lot of tangents, so every once in a while you have to get me back in. Um, I remember getting the call from Guy Eastman, and he said, hey, I want you to, you're going to run camera for Cameron. He's got this tag in Wyoming. And I'm like, oh yeah, no problem. I'm in shape, right? <laughs> I'm about 27, 28 years old. I'm mean, still pretty good, you know, about a buck 35, right? Still pretty, pretty good shape. And I show up at the trailhead, he's bringing me a new pack because we had a sponsored pack at the time and so we had to use that pack and everything. Well, one of my excuses, I've got many, one of my excuses was I put the pack on, it was a large belt. Because you know, on a, on a pack you can change the belts out. I'm not a large. 
So I had that thing buckled all the way and it still came down to about right here on my hips. And I'm trying to find, I'm trying to follow this marathon, 100 mile freaking beast through the mountain, you know, it just didn't set myself up for success. So I crawled up in a fetal position and I cried for a little bit. And then I realized, hey, suck it up, buttercup, let's go. I think we figured out how to cut the foam and get the thing. Anyway, we made it work. We had, I couldn't, I couldn't understand why he was so against trails. Like there's this beautiful trail that works up to the ridge and then we can cut across and he just goes straight up the mountain. First, before we first hit our first camp, he had my, my sleeping bag, half of my gear in his pack, right? And I'm just trying to keep up with him. Now mind you, I was a college wrestler. I was pretty tough, or I thought I was. Humble pie, so that's what I ate for dinner that night. And then, as we sat there, we had four days worth of food. Okay, the plan was, we we're gonna go in there, I had a mule deer tag, he had a mule deer tag, he had an elk tag. Opportunities, a lot, hey, there's a lot of critters you can kill there, right? We were gonna go in, he was gonna kill a mule deer because we were gonna go high first. Early September, we were gonna go high. And then we we're gonna pack that out, grab my bow, go up, see if, we, if the elk were bugling, we'd go after elk, if not, I'd get a chance to hunt mule deer. Well, four days worth of food. On the morning of the ninth morning, four days worth of food. On the morning of the ninth morning, we've finally decided, and by, by now my mind has switched. The flip has switched, I'm good. We started rationing food a long time ago. I'm just back into weight cutting mode, I'm fine, no big deal. But that f switch flipped, and we were as predatorial as I've ever been in my life when it comes to hunting. I wanted to kill a bull because I wanted to cook it right there. At least the back straps, right? Tenderloins. Um, that morning, we got into a basin. We were gonna, if we didn't get any, on anything that morning, we were gonna hike out, and get more food and come back in. Oh, I missed something. On the third morning, snowed six inches. My only job on this hunt was to film. Mike Eastman told me, and, and Cam, hey, if you guys don't get this on film, don't come back. Because at the time, Cam had shot a few creatures and the cameraman wasn't on them. Well, what good is the footage if the cameraman's over here trying to find the animal and, and he shoots him over there, right? You don't have anything that you can show. We said, yes, sir, because that's what you say to Mike Eastman. And I woke up the fourth morning, my camera wouldn't work. Because the kind of, I kept it in my, in my bag with me. Thought that was the smart thing to do. Condensation had made it not work. So we got up and I'm like, we gotta, we gotta hike out, go to town. Town was probably 40 miles away, but you know, the hike out was gonna be five, six miles. I don't remember how many, it was, a, it was gonna be a while to get out. But I, I, my camera won't work. So we can't hunt. He said, we're not hiking out. You won't make it back in. I said, you just wanna kick me right now? I mean, come on. But he was right. Again, humble pie. So I did a lot of praying that day. By the next day, the sun came out. I opened the camera up. And if I held the zoom button down, it would stay. If I picked it up, it would zoom all the way out electronics, but it did dry out, boom, ninth morning. Bull bugles, we drop in. Now, I, Cam did not, at this time, Cam did not believe in calling. I like to call elk. So I would be calling as we're moving, and he would set up as long as I could get the angle on the camera. So I called, then I put a big old chew of snuff in. Oh, I had plenty of snuff. 
I didn't have any food, but I had plenty of snooze. I look up, a bull bugles up on this bench. And, and I'm, I'm like, this camera's in front of me. I got the camera. And we look up and we see antlers coming, right? And he's probably 40 yards away, bailing off that bench, coming right at us. We're in, caught in the dead open. And I'm running camera. And the bull's coming right at Cam. And Cam's just like this. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what Cam thought if he was pretending he was invisible, but he came to full draw. The bull's 20 yards away. What do you think the bull does? Wheels and starts to go up the ridge. And I go, eel, eel. That's all I did. The bull stops and turns and looks. Cam lets the air out of him. Bull goes up and just, I was the most beautiful thing. So we, we give each other hugs, pats on the back, we're all excited. We go recover the bull, we film it. And we're like, okay, what do we do now? Well, we had an outfitter buddy that had been on a hunt. That's why we packed ourselves in. Usually, a lot of times he'd have an outfitter pack him in, drop him off for a couple of days or nine days, a hundred days, I don't know how many days. So I had a little bit of service on my cell phone and I climbed up to the ridge and I called the home office and I said, we got a bull down. Can you call so-and-so and have him come in? They said, where are you at? I told them exactly. Boom. We go down. We get this bull quartered, hung in the tree, you know, taken care of, ready to be packed out. Or if, if, if nobody showed up, we were going to cook something. And then we were going to start loading our packs and we were going to start packing it out. And all we, uh, we happen to hear is, And we go out in this opening and there's a pack string of horses up on the ridge. And we're like, oh, we're safe. He shows up, he has a, a liter of Pepsi and those submarine sandwiches you buy at gas stations in his saddlebags. Oh, it was a happy day. I couldn't even eat a quarter of that sandwich. I think my stomach has shrunk up. So that's my story on how I got into the industry and was humbled immediately. But I grew up guiding elk hunters, mule deer hunters, stuff in New Mexico, moved up here, and it, my mind was opened up to all of these new critters and I started riding. And that's where I got into the industry. So when I left Eastman's, I formed Outback Outdoors in 2008 with some buddies. Our desire was to film our hunts the way they really are, but kind of with a cinematic flair, so with good camera work, if, uh, as much as you can. I've never had an animal say, wait, cut, redo, redo. It doesn't work, you know, so you got to be on it. It's almost like filming a wedding, except without Bridezilla. It's almost like that, okay? Because you can't retake when the, when the bride walks down the aisle. You can't stop and go, oh, do that again, you know. Right, that, that'd be bad. So it's really, you got to be, a, you got to be on it. So in 2008, we, we started this show. We were on the Sportsman's Channel. We went to Amazon Prime, and, and then Amazon Prime started kicking hunting shows off. We won't get into the politics of that. But So we're on YouTube now. I got seasons and seasons and seasons of stuff on YouTube. Outback Outdoors, check us out. What we're doing now, because we'll go on a five-day hunt. I'm not talking about mule deer at all, am I? Sorry about this, guys. I go off on tangents. We go on a five-day hunt and we have five days of footage, but it's a 22-minute show. So there's a lot of stuff that's really good that gets cut out. So Corey and I decided, Corey's my head of production, what we decided is we're going to form dailies. And we're going to go through and pick the good stuff. You're not going to have to watch us sit there and glass for four hours. But we're going to pick the good conversations, the good info that would be valuable. Maybe there's some funny stuff, maybe there's some good animal interaction, whatever. We're going to pick that and that's what we're going to share. So you might have a seven minute portion. We might have a hunt that has 22 episodes, but they're broken up into dailies. Okay. Or I, I don't want them to get too long because you don't want to watch 45 minutes, but you can watch 13 minutes at a time, 20 minutes at a time, right? Especially on the web because you can watch it on your phone or you can watch it on your laptop. So 2008, we started that and, um, th 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 the industry's evolved. So that's where we're at. So I want you guys to go check that out. 
YouTube, Outback Outdoors. Today, public land mule deer. Let's jump right into it. Who's a, who's a mule deer hunter? Who's an archery mule deer hunter? Okay. If you're not an archery mule deer hunter, this applies to you. It doesn't matter. You just gotta get closer if you have a bow in hand, right? I mean, that's, 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 that's the bottom line. Spotting and stalking mule deer. One of the funnest things you can do with your clothes on, okay? Um, there's a lot of nuances to it. I'm gonna show you a video here because this, uh, this is a hunt that happened where the close proximity of bow hunting, I think it ups the ante a little bit. Well, I'll let you, I'll let you decide. This is a, a hunt where a good buddy of mine, Dave Baronio, um, we've got this buck bedded. You notice how windy it is. For us, mule deer hunting, wind is our friend. You can see the buck bedded there, down there in the bottom. If you look real close, the next time it goes to that screen, there's also a buck bedded above him, okay? Now, he wants to shoot the buck on the bottom. Definitely a better buck. See that buck bedded right there? Now, that buck is heads on the ground. He gets up. As you see, buck is right here. They're pretty close, about seven yards. What pin do you shoot for seven yards? All of them. No, I'm just kidding. So, you know, we're talking, of, that's the culmination, right? But getting to that spot, ah, that's like the recipe of a good taco, right? So, the first thing we do in Colorado is you gotta draw the tag. All right? There are states where you can still buy some over-the-counter stuff, and there is some easier to draw tags in Colorado. We gotta set our expectations, okay? If I'm going and I spend 22 points and I'm going to a unit 44 for fourth rifle, my expectations are gonna be high. I hunted that unit three, four years ago, and I passed on probably 13, 190 bucks. And I should have shot a buck that was over 200, but he was so close I grabbed my bow instead of the rifle. Why do you take a bow on a rifle hunt? I'm a moron. He was 35 yards and he's running, so he's stupid, and he's walking, and we're leaning against the truck glassing where he's supposed to be on that ridge. He was down in the bottom and walked up out on us. Anyway, it didn't work out. Eight, I ate my tag, but my expectations were I'm not gonna shoot a small buck. I'm gonna shoot this, I, I've killed a lot of 140s, 150s, 160s. This was my chance to kill a big buck if I'm not, and I'm not gonna take a young buck or I wasn't gonna take a buck that was below 200. My choice. There was a buck that we passed on that was 23 points, but he was the mainframe of a one, like a 140 inch buck. 23 points, he wasn't impressive to me. Game warden who had actually got the tag on a reissue shot that buck. He went 196. I'm a moron. So, setting our expectations. We gotta do our homework. A lot of that comes even prior to applying. The area and the size of the buck, uh, the area and the size of buck you're targeting is going to set your expectations. And you have to set them before you step foot into the woods. You don't want to be looking down the barrel or at full draw going, do I want to shoot this buck? It's too late. Decide before. What is, I, go, I live by a code of shoot on the first day what you would shoot on the last day. And I can live with that. So you get into, you see these type of bucks, top left, mid range. Uh, impressive, they're pretty cool. Um, real cool because I shot that one with the stick bow. That's always fun, right? The one on the right, fuzzy, fuzzy wuzzy mule deer. Now this is a 180 inch buck, 184, right? But I knew he was there. That was the only buck I was hunting. Now if I went to that area where I shot those bucks expecting to shoot that buck, I might as well stay in camp. They just, the, the genetics aren't there, right? The next things we have to factor into is terrain. 
What type of terrain are we going to be hunting? Every t different type of terrain is going to dictate the type of hunt you're going to go on, how you're going to hunt it, the equipment you need. If I'm in the high country, and let me explain what I mean high country, I'm talking 9 to 12. So we're talking just below timberline to above timberline. I, I instantly go to those early season mule deer bucks in the high country, still in velvet, right? That's what I'm talking when I'm talking high country. How is my backpack going to be different for that hunt than if I'm hunting in the lowlands? It's going to be very different, right? Because I might have my, my camp on my back, right? I might be hopping, ridge hopping, glassing, trying to find, right? Okay? Or, here's an example. Nice little fuzzy wuzzy. Lowland draws. What about lowland draws? Does that make sense? So I'm talking cuts where I grew up, it was called arroyos. Arroyos. Okay, say that with me, arroyos. So cut banks, right? Broken country. I love this because you can get, you can spot them, they disappear, and as long as you watch that big draw, they don't come out. You know they're in there somewhere, then it's cat and mouse, right? Then you're working different angles trying to see him, and sure enough, he's bedded up under this cut bank. Nah. Then you get the wind right and go kill it, right? So that's that lowland country. A lot of, a lot of that in, in some coming off the foothills, Western Nebraska, Wyoming, some of that country. New Mexico has a lot of that. So that's an example of the lowland. Then you get into the cedar, the sagebrush, flats, right? Um, foothills, great example, foothills. We got a ton of that up and down here on the Western Slope. Outside of Craig, right? That's 201, right? Okay and you're dealing with different topography, different terrain. Then you get into agricultural areas. Sometimes those aren't public, sometimes, very rarely they're public. But a lot of times you can utilize those for the travel quarter. Very rarely if you have an ag field where the animals bed there. They're gonna work up the draws, bed there and come back. We can create an ambush situation, right? on those travel routes, okay? And sometimes you get permission to hunt or you shoot them and they jump the fence and then you go knock on the door and they let you come get him in the middle of their alfalfa. Sometimes that happens. So terrain, during early scouting and researching, what am I looking for? Number one is a glassing spot. I don't know how many times I've seen people taking their bows for a walk. You will never outwalk elk and you will never outwalk mule deer. I got friends, and you guys probably all do or you're one of them, that puts miles on their boots and doesn't see jack. Yet I'm the guy on the hill watching you jump all those elk out, all those mule deer out. Because you're, you're walking down here and your, your thermals are going right up to them and they're bedded on that bench. I tell people, people ask me, what's the number one thing I should do if I'm gonna go hunting? Get a good pair of optics and don't walk through country. Find a glassing spot and be patient. Hey, I'm the guy that grew up in New Mexico. I didn't even have optics. I had a gun and a scope and if I needed to look at anything, I looked at it through my scope. We walked country out and we hoped we could get a shot as we saw the backside of that deer running out of the canyon. That's how we hunted. I didn't know any different. Then as I got older, I started thinking and I got around people that were really good hunters and they were putting on half the miles I were and they were killing animals every year. The difference is they were locating and then working in. If you're not seeing elk or deer where you're looking, move. That's the difference between us and whitetail hunters. If you're in that tree stand and the wind is right, all you can do is sit. You can't go walking around the woods because you'll never see anything, right? big difference okay so how do we do that we're gonna pick our spots I am a big fan of onyx okay um, situation like this if I'm coming into this country I can see my entryways through my ATV or you know four-wheeler or whatever and then I'm looking where can I get up I might be able to park here and walk out to that see that little point there I should be able to see about a mile in 
almost all the way around me. That's what we want. I don't have to worry about my wind blowing animals out. I don't have to worry about, well, when I'm scouting for sure, um, I don't have to worry about people walking over me. They might walk through where I'm, I'm looking, but a lot of times I'll see people walking and that gets deer up and I see them go and then they bed here. Now, I wouldn't have seen them because they were already bedded, okay? So if you'll utilize this, find your glassing points. Don't expect to go scouting and see deer and then see them opening morning. Don't do that, that's, that's ridiculous. Same thing with elk. Just locate, go to your glassing spot, mark it on your, on your map deal, and say, yes, I can see this. You can look around, make sure, okay, this is glassing spot one. Then I'm going to find another one. I wanna have options. When are you gonna see animals moving? Anyone? Early morning, late evening. Now, mind you, I have been so far out that I wasn't gonna walk back, and so I take a nap under a tree and I get bored, so I start glassing, and I'll be danged if something doesn't stand up. Hey, there's a deer right there, I didn't even know, right? So that happens. Um, but primarily we're gonna see when they're moving, they're easiest to spot, then we watch them bed, voila. Now we have it as dumb and dumber, so you're saying there's a shot, right? So, Picking the right glassing spot is key. This is not the right glassing spot, okay? How long could I sit there with a handheld binoculars? What moron took that picture? Oh, all right. Handheld binos, you're gonna have handheld binos. It's a must. Um, I, have a, I have a little bit of a shake. I, I, I don't know why, I just, my hand does shake just a little bit. And so if I'm, concentrating on holding my glasses, I just, I use 10 power because 12 power, I'll get seasick. That's just me. I know guys that have steady hands and go, but I can't do it very long. So my key, the most important glass I carry is my 15s. I've also used, uh, Maven makes an 18, that's really clear. I'm a big Swarovski fan. They're expensive as all get out, but I tell you, I promise you, spend as much money as you can on your glass. It's worth it. There's nothing worse than you finally find a buck and the head, headache you have from eye strain is miserable. And I'm gonna tell you what eye strain is. Eye strain comes from the lack of clarity from the center of your eyesight or your picture to the edge, okay? Why are Swarovski's 3,200 bucks and Bushnell's are 250? Because Bushnell's have, at the very center it's clear, but the edge-to-edge -edge clarity is crud. So if you're moving, even on a tripod, and you're moving around, and you're looking at the edge of your, imagine your eye darting to the edge of your vision, your eyeball always wants to be forced back to the clearest spot. You're fighting that all day long. That's eye strain, okay? So the more, the more quality glass you can get, I promise you, you'll be able to glass longer, longer. So that's what I use. I use an outdoorsman tripod also. They don't give it away, but I've had it for 12 years and it's light. And if it breaks, it's lifetime warranty. I'll send it back and they'll fix it and send me a new one or send me a new one. Worth it, okay? Because I hope to be hunting in another 10 years still, okay? Last thing I throw in my bag, only if I'm not, if I don't have my camp on my back, is a spotting scope. My 15s are fine if I'm bailing off and I'm gonna be living like a caveman for a couple days, right? But when is, I don't take my spotting scope out and look through it like my binoculars, because I'll get a headache for that too. What I do is I find an animal, now I'm gonna classify, then I'll pull that out, or I, I, think, that's an, I think that's an antler. Boom, I'll pull my spotting scope, I can get clarification. But that's because it's in my day pack. It's not my overnight pack, it's in my day pack. And I'm within, you know, however long, getting to and from where I'm, I'm coming from, okay? Get comfortable, I can't tell you how bad this is. Um, it, again, along with the spotting scope, if you can take a, a, a cheap, lightweight camp chair, and then you can put your, your, your your tripod kind of over you and lean back, you can get real comfortable, especially with, 
with, with your binoculars. The other thing is they make a nice little, you, you guys seen the, the pads that you throw under your sleeping bag? Well, they have little ones and they're for glassing, for sitting down. That's good. Where I hunt a lot of uh, cactus, yeah, you'll, the first time you realize that you put your pad on a cactus and you didn't catch one in the behind, you'll be glad you did. And they're cheap. So get comfortable, always use a tripod, please. It'll be worth, you will find more animals. Example, my nephews got into hunting and my nephew's like 26, so he's not a kid, he's a grown man, but he lives in New Mexico. So I invited him out to go on a hunt with me, elk hunt, and um, he was expecting us to move a lot and stuff like this, and he had his binoculars, and, and then he was blown away that we sat for hours looking at it. So I had an extra pair of binoculars, and I lent him a tripod. He spotted, he said, I've never seen this much elk in my life, because it was always this. The other thing, if you're comfortable, I was, uh, well, I'm not gonna tell you where it was, but I was on a ridge hunting mule deer. Uh, you guys almost got me there. I almost gave away some secrets. I was on a ridge hunting mule deer and I was in my little chair, kind of tucked up. It was a little warm, mid, wasn't quite midday, but I was, the, the deer had just bedded down and I had two bucks bedded and I'm watching them. And I hear something and I look up and it's two bow hunters. And they're probably from me to that restroom sign, so maybe a hundred yards. Um, down the ridge, but I'm a little bit over the edge in the shade. And they come up and they said, one of the guys, I gotta give him credit, he sat down, put his elbows on his, on his knees and he glassed, I timed him. 12 minutes and they were up and gone. The bucks were 250 yards across the canyon from him. Never saw him. Right, okay? Get comfortable, be patient. Location, 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 that's not just for restaurants. It's key for glassing spots. To stock or not to stock? That is the question. All right, we're here. We got a bug bedded. We got to pick our stocks carefully. What does that mean? Well, would you guys agree with me that bow hunting is a game of percentage? So if we pooled all the bow hunters, we would probably find some that say it takes me 15 stocks to kill a buck. And then we'd find a guy who doesn't go on as many stocks, but he's three to one. I'm probably four to five to one, okay? If I look back the last 10 years, it takes me probably four or five stocks, to, I'm not saying to kill a buck, to get a shot opportunity. And that's what we're going for. It's a, it's a game of numbers. Put ourselves in a posi position where we can come to full draw. And then we have the high percentage plays. Those are the ones that you go, oh baby, let's do this. And the hardest thing is sometimes you have to wait because it's a high percentage play, but conditions need to be right. We'll talk about that in a second. Don't be afraid to fail, because it's gonna happen. If bow hunting was easy, everybody would do it, right? Right? Okay. So here's a classic situation where I failed. Here we are. Got a buck bedded in a cut bank, man. He's bedded right up under that, that kind of that clean dirt bank. So I, not a big guy, pretty sneaky. I send my buddy Dave with a decoy. I get to a position where I know if he stands up, I'm letting the air out of him, okay? I can even stand up. Now, when I stand up, all I can see is his head, right? So I don't have a shot, so I gotta have him stand. So Dave is up here walking up there. See the buck? He's bedded right there. I'm there. Dave just moves down the ridge line. He's about 200 yards apart with this decoy. All I got to do is wait for him to look up and look at Dave. He's not spooked. He's just looking at that other deer that's walking. I come to full draw and I make a beautiful shot. It makes that good thump sound.
And then I realized I shot into the dirt bank. Oops. He was tucked right behind that, and there was the sun there and the moon there, and I'm pretty sure I had a bug in my eye, and I shot right into that dirt bank. What an awesome opportunity, though, right? Who was here earlier that watched the, the little, where, I, where the guy came down and shot the buck? Well, you guys are all here. That wasn't the one I showed. It was the one I showed earlier in this. He came over, stood up, right? That, that's the same buck. Four days later. We called him Lucky. He's not so lucky anymore. But seriously, that's the same buck. So it's kind of cool. Um, so we have to be uh, not be afraid to fail. I talk about day beds. It's really important that you understand what a day bed is. Mule deer are horrible about going. Sun comes up, thermals start to rise, and they bed. And we as hunters, let's go get them. The problem is they're not going to be bedded there long. You can, I mean, I bet the farm on this. They're probably within an hour, hour and a half, they're probably gonna get up and readjust. Because the sun's gonna get to a position where their shade that they were under is gonna be gone. And then they're gonna find better shade that they'll have through most of the afternoon. So we call that their day bed, okay? I have made the mistake of moving too soon. He's right here, he's right here. Get up there, he's gone. Well, he was bedded, he, now he's bedded over there and I'm sitting here looking like this and he jumps up and leaves. Because I didn't let him get into his day bed. Once they get in their day bed, you can be pretty sure they're gonna be there for a while, okay? There's other conditions to understand, but I don't care if it's first rifle, fourth rifle, September. Most bucks will bed unless they're rutting then they don't hardly bed, right? Because they're always chasing does. But normally they're gonna bed, they'll get up, they'll readjust, and they'll bed for most of that day, a good period, okay? That's when we can be aggressive. But don't be stupid. Use common sense, we're still hunting. You can fool their eyes, you can fool their, fool their ears, but you'll never fool their nose. Wind is important, okay? So we can fool their eyes, by staying hidden. Plan your approach. Fool their ears, let some wind pick up. I love hunting wind. I love hunting mule deer in about 15 to 20 miles per hour wind. If it's 30, something's gonna die. Because I can, I'll walk right up to them. Because I know where my wind's going because I have such a steady wind. I know where my scent is. And they can't hear me. And I better not be walking in full view of them or I'm an idiot, right? Live to stalk another day if it's not right back up, okay? Now, we, it's easy to say when you're on hunting deer that nobody know about, what about when you got a hunter on that ridge and a hunter on that ridge? Public land, right? Hey, you're gonna have to make that call. But a lot of times if you'll back up and depend upon the ignorance of the normal hunter, and I don't mean to say that to be rude, as long as you don't bust that buck out of there, somebody else isn't gonna get in on him because he's bedded, they're not gonna find him. Pull yourself back, come in from the right approach. Or let him be, if he's in a honey hole. We killed a deer last year um, and it was second rifle. And my buddies, my best friends from high school, we hadn't hunted deer in 35 years. And we said, this is ridiculous. You guys got some points. Why don't you come out? Let's hunt in Colorado. There's a good over, it's not over the counter, but it's easy to draw for non-residents. I think it took two preference points. You know what kind of unit that's gonna be. Elk's open, deer's open. I got 100 people around me and a lot of does and four corns. And there's a lot of four corns dying off the road, right? People are shooting, bah, 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 bah. He's, they're shooting these yearlings, right? So we end up going between the main highway and the high country where everybody is, and we just sit in glass. The first day we finally pick up this good buck, 170 inch buck, nice buck. We couldn't get to him that day. There was no way. We pull out, we're gonna go back in, find him the next day. 
nowhere to be found. But nobody's in there. Nobody's in there glass in that area. I mean, we saw a few guys going through, but they were just kind of going through. Four, was it the fourth day we got on him again, Corey? Fourth day, that, was it the fourth day we got? We, I think the fourth day we finally turned him up. And my buddy, my best friend from high school, shot a 170 inch butt. And it was awesome, All right? And we just were patient. And it's a highly public land. There was a ton of people in there. Yeah. So sometimes you get those little hidey holes. If, you know, this, when people pull up, act like you're glassing the other way, you know, do that. Uh, hey, I've done it before. They pull up and we're on this side. Oh, now we're glassing the other side of the road. All right. So one of the other things, once we get this target buck, we gotta know exactly the location. How many people have bedded a buck down and then you start to move down and you get down there and that tree that you picked looks like every other tree? Or that rock outcrop you thought was there, there's five of them? Oh, that sucks. So you gotta know your, your exact location. Sometimes you can use big structures like uh, a, a rock cliff, and then there's a, a lone dead tree, and then he's under the, the juniper, you know, or something like that. A couple of things that you can see from everywhere in order to know where you're at. Because as you close that distance, everything's gonna look different. I promise you, okay? You got adrenaline pumping, right? You're on a stock, it's about to go down. Know where you're at, know your location. I use a, a Onyx for that all the time. What I'll do is I'll pull up Onyx. First of all, I'll download where I'm hunting so I don't have to have internet. Have you done that where you, you're like, crap, I forgot, to, I forgot to download it and you don't have any Wi-Fi or I'm a, a cell service. So download it, it's pretty simple, doesn't take up a lot of space and then you, you can use it to navigate. And I'll pull it up and I'm like, okay, there's the draw, there's the bluff, okay. he's under this tree and I'll mark it. Okay, here's an example I did, just showing, of course, it's from my laptop, but you know, just something like this. There's, there I am glassing, there's where the buck is. Now on my phone, as I get there, I can go, okay, I think he's there. Oh no, he's over here, oh okay. And it can help you tune in. The best way though, is have some spotters. I think, exactly, I think it's easier to find, I don't think my wife's here, a, a, a good hunting partner than it is to find a wife. I don't really mean that. My wife is amazing and it took me 26 years to find her, but it is hard. You gotta have the same hunting philosophies. You gotta be able to get along. You gotta be unselfish, right? So it's hard, but if you have some help, it is invaluable to have some spotters that can guide you in. We used to use a little simple hand signal. So, tell me how corny this is. Imagine you were on another hill and you saw me doing this. This means everything's okay. The buck is still there. Simple, I'm on the spot, I look back at my spotter, he goes like this. Done, I keep moving. This means he stood up and walked this way. <laughs> Pretty simple. Right? So you can come up with things like that because a lot of times you don't have cell service or you, you're not supposed to do electronic communication depending on your state's regs. Right? So it's pretty simple to do that. Keep your spotter, your spotter can tell you. It's invaluable because as a hunter, what am I saying? I wonder if he's there. I wonder if he's still there. I wonder if he's still there. I wonder if he's still there. I wonder if, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm going faster and faster and faster because I'm scared he's not there. So it makes me slow down and calm down so that I can do my stock patiently. Again, I'm trusting that he's in his day bed and he's gonna be there a while. And if I have the wind right, which we'll talk about in a bit, I don't have anything to worry about because I'm out of his line of sight and he can't smell me. You can fool his eyes, you can fool his ears, but you can't fool his nose, right? Okay, spotters are invaluable. If you guys have questions, just raise your hand. This is informal, okay. If you need me to clarify anything or whatever, all right. 
Once you close the distance, know your effective range. I don't care what weapon you're hunting with, know your range. Hey, just because you can shoot 60 yards, a pipe plate at your house with no wind, standing up, doesn't mean you need to shoot 60 yards in the, in the, in the woods. It doesn't. Okay? Know your effective range. The way you do that, and I actually do a seminar on how to determine your effective range, is you shoot under different conditions. And you shoot one arrow. So if I'm kneeling on an unlevel surface and there's a 15 mile per hour crosswind, my effective range might be 30 yards. Now mind you, the other night I was cranking them at 80, right, like a champ. No wind, standing up, right? It's not my effective range, okay? No elevation change. So you gotta put the practice in to know and then, just like your expectations on the size or the trophy class of your buck, you need to have the, your expectations of what that is before it happens. 65 yards, ah, close enough. Boom. Man, please don't do that. Please be willing to put limits on yourself, okay? We owe that to the animal. Okay. Be patient. Once you get into that kill zone and he's bedded and all you see is the head or whatever and you're crouched down, be patient. The hard work's done. But mentally, this is the toughest part of the whole thing. Because you have to have the patience to wait for the shot. So that might mean, depending upon the terrain and the topography, uh, the, the vegetation, I might have to pick my lanes. Boom, you're ranging everything. You know what it is. Because you're going to have to wait for that buck to stand up. Be patient. Then you have a few choices to make. I'm going to share this. My buddy Sloan, I got to take him mule deer hunting. You'll notice a lot of the same footage. This is easy for us to film in this country because there's a lot of deer and a lot of opportunities. And um, it's one of my favorite hunts. It's not physically super demanding, but I can get two or three camera angles. And it's out in Nebraska. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, again, it's a lot like the New Mexico train, some of that stuff. Um, and it's a lot of glassing, but then once you're in there, you can kind of work through some of these cut, cut banks. And I'll just play it and be quiet for a second. They were literally working because they'd seen a buck drop into a draw, but they didn't know exactly where he was. And then they just happened to see him shake his head and bed down. This buck, where they're at, they're not 200 yards from this buck. And they were just about to walk up that ridge and blow him out of there. I mean, it was just picture perfect how lucky it was that they saw him. Because now, okay, what's the wind doing? How do I approach? How do I get within range? Sloan decides he's going to go up here. You can see the wind. He has a pretty decent wind, not worried about getting busted. But the buck is bedded so far up against that cut bake, he makes the choice. He's going to pick up a little rock, which has never worked for me, not once. And he's going to chunk the rock. And in his athletic prowess, he's going to hook onto his release Look at this. So he balances his bow. He's got his release hooked. Ready? Here we go. Can you do it? Okay, here we go. And he comes to full draw. And the buck steps up and stops. I've tried that three times. Every time the last, the, they stop about the county line. So, you have to make decisions. How do you make him stand? We use decoys a lot. So the other op option would have been to have somebody come on the opposite ridge 300 yards away. Not a threatening distance. Pop up a decoy and just act like you're a buck. And most likely they're going to stand up and look. But they didn't have another guy who could go run the decoy. They just had the two cameramen and him. So they made the most of it. He killed probably the best buck in his life that he'll probably ever kill because I don't know if I'm going to let him hunt with me again. 
Understanding body language. We have to understand animal body language. What does it say to you if a buck's ears are forward and he's standing, neck stretched? He's alert, right? Where if they're relaxed, his head's down, relaxed posture, right? So sometimes I get into a position where I'm not actually behind something. I'm actually in front of something. And let's say, because all I can see is his antlers, but then the buck stands up. Well, I'm in his field of view, but I'm not moving, okay? So if I'm not moving, most likely he's not gonna see me. I know camo is a huge fashion statement, and I do wear camo. Movement is what deer see. I could literally go out in this and do quite well. Basic colors, okay, earth, earth tones. Right. But I'm going to understand body language. If I see that buck put his head down, look away, put his ears forward, that his ears, a, a mule deer's ears will block their peripheral vision. So maybe he's looking over here and his ears are forward. Boom, I can draw. So by reading body language, I can get away with things. You've got to know. Because you've got to get in position and you've got to be able to draw your bow. With a rifle, it's not as much, as much a, a concern. But you don't want to, you don't want to take a shot at a, at a uh, a buck that's super strung strung out either. You, if you can, you want them to be stopped, where you can squeeze through, follow through the shot, just like a bow. Is the animal alert? Windy conditions. How many times have I said this? I love hunting mule deer and wind, but high winds will put them on the alert. Why? Nose and ear hearing. Those are out of the question. They don't have those senses, all there are is, they only got their eyes. So they are sketched out, okay? So that's something to be aware of. Did they see me already? They might not have boogered out, but is there a possibility they're seeing me? If they're looking and they're, right? It's one thing to look and see a shape and then go back to feeding. But if they're keyed on me, I don't want to try and draw. We just got to draw at the right time. You're gonna make mistakes, don't be afraid to fail. But nothing is worse than getting to that point and not being able to get drawn. Oh, it's so frustrating. You know? It's like a screen door on a submarine. It don't make no sense, right? All right. How does wind affect the area I'm hunting? That's key. I'm not gonna go into this huge. We're just gonna gloss over this because I can spend a lot of time on this and we're running out of time. Predominant wind, what is the predominant wind? If I look on my map and I'm hunting in Kansas and it says I have a northeast wind, that's my predominant wind, my prevailing wind, right? Doesn't necessarily mean it's northeast in the mountains. I could look on it and read it, doesn't mean that's how it's gonna go. It's like a river, it's gonna flow through the canyons, okay? Thermals, what are thermals? Thermals are rising. Thermals are the heating or cooling of the air by, by basically sun radiation, okay? When it heats up, it does what? Rises. When it cools down, it falls, right? So you'll be on the edge of a cliff in the middle of the day, and if you threw a feather off of there, that feather would rise. And you would think you're a magician, but you're not. Evening, it drops. So it's the combination of the predominant wind where thermals hit, and that's where we get the toilet bowl. Most people call it swirling wind. I call it a toilet bowl because it sucks. Because usually animals bed on a bench that gets that type of airflow because they can smell from a 360. All right? They're not stupid. All right. Here is a great example of a situation where a buddy of mine, CJ Davis, the president of Montana Decoy, is a stick bow shooter. We get this buck bedded, and we get kind of close. But the wind is so perfect, maybe we're too close? I stay back, I'm just running camera. So the buck is bedded right here. Ideally, we could get to about four yards above him and just shoot him in his bed, we think.
It's amazing how different it looks, even in a little, you know exactly where he's at, but just do I go to this side of the point or do I go to this side of the point? And everything makes all the difference in the world to whether or not we're gonna be able to get a shot. So you can see his antlers there. And finally he stands up on his own accord, mind you. But look at what he does, holy! And he stops at 20 yards. And CJ misses him. <laughs> he did have a stick bow. I mean, I should have given him a dart. He'd probably been more accurate. Oh, CJ's a good dude. I've taken him three times and we, we've yet to get him to kill a mule deer. We're going to, we're gonna do it. He's gonna kill a mule deer with that stick bow. He's killed t elk, he's killed whitetail, he's killed tons of stuff. He's just bit, I mean, you know. So, the other thing we're gonna go, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna quickly go through this because we're running out of time and I wanna have questions. Understanding topography. It's very important that you understand how the lay of the land works. Being able to read elevation grades are, is good. A lot of mapping has that. If you're looking at a flat surface, elevation tells you, okay, I know there's a draw there, okay? So I'm not gonna go too much into that, but that's important. Using the lay of the land, stay, out of hi stay hidden. Drop off into the next draw, find out where you can go over and pop over rather than trying to just belly crawl from bush to bush to bush. Stay out, as, out, of, out of sight as long as you can. Programs like Onyx really help. And then ideally, this is of course a screen grab from what we saw early. Here's Sloan, here's the buck. Wind is coming straight into his face. He's literally walking up towards the buck. You know the difference is I, because I just, I don't know, I would have probably belly crawled or hands and knees did up and then stood up. He didn't, he just walked. It didn't matter. As long as the buck couldn't see him, right? But you just think, I gotta be sneaky, I gotta be sneaky. Don't be afraid to back out. In the situation where CJ was right on that buck, hindsight's always 20-20, right? If he's looking this way, they would have been better off just come back 10 yards and come around. So when that buck stood up, he wasn't in their peripheral, right? To be honest, when they got there, they saw his antlers and they thought he was looking that way because he was so symmetrical, they got confused. I could see them, but I didn't know how far they were, you know, as, as far as this way. So, back out, reevaluate. Sometimes mule deer hunting, everything seems to go right and it doesn't. Now, I showed one of my screw ups. I'm going to show a buddy of mine screw up now. So, we find this buck, and he's a really good buck, and he's bedded. Look at how deep that cut bank is. You could drive a dump truck up to the edge of that, that cut bank and he'd never see you. He'd probably hear you, but you know what I mean. So Dave works over and he thinks he knows where the buck is. And he would get to a position where I can film the buck, but Dave can't really see me, but he thinks he knows where that buck is. So he's going to this, and I mean, that's gotta be 10, 12 foot deep, right? And he go, he's right there, the buck is right there, has no idea he's in the country. So Dave said, just, and this is him telling me later, I'm just gonna draw and walk over and shoot him in his bed. Except when he took a step, he pulled the trigger. Shot into the opposite bank and the buck blew out. I guess I'm not the only moron. And that's where he's bedded. And he's just like, I'm an idiot. Hey, what a great opportunity, right? We still laugh about it every time we get together. That was a high percentage stock. Something still went wrong, but that was a high percentage stock, right? He could be aggressive getting there. He had the wind nailed. He just had to wait. Probably the best plan would have been to just sit here bow ready, 
let the, the buck's going to get up. He can't climb up the, he's going to go that way. It's the only way out. It's a dead end. Sit there. The buck goes up, come to full draw, and shoot him. Hindsight's always 2020. So, review, day bed, be aggressive. Use your buddy as a spotter. It gives you that warm fuzzy. It'll slow you down. I promise you will be more successful. Because you will be able to concentrate on getting to position and not worried if the buck's gone, okay? And if the buck does stand up and go, he might stand up and bed another 20 yards away. And then you can have that communication. We have had situations where we're like, right? The buck's still there, but he comes all the way back around and we say, dude, you need to go up and above. He moved. Oh, okay. So then he has to go back, right? But it's worth it. We killed the buck. Wait for the right shot. Here's a screenshot of Sloan at full draw on that buck, right? Now he threw the little, right? Had never worked for me, worked for him. You know, whether it's waiting and you're the patient kind and you just wait for them to stand up on their own, that's probably your best percentage. Or the decoy on the far ridge, something like that, grab his attention. Heck, sometimes you just sit there and a cow, if, it's, if there's cows around, you know, feeding, there's cows on public land everywhere, you know, we've got grazing leases, and a cow pops up. Buck stands up, looks, boom, might be your shot. Let the buck stand on his own if you can. Use decoys, wait for the right shot. Okay. So that's pretty fun picture. It's a screen grab, so it's kind of not as, not as clear as it should be. I don't know if you can tell this, but this is an arrow in flight. That's an arrow in flight. He was six yards from that buck. The wind is ripping this way. He just literally walked down. It would have been easy because I shoot left-handed and I could have shot him like this, but he had to do this to shoot him. So what I did is I popped the decoy up on the other ridge. I'm running a camera, got my camera up, boom, it's running, it's videoing. Then when he gave me the giddy up sign, I popped the decoy up and I just started walking across the top ridge. And all the buck did was look, put his ears up, block his peripheral vision, and Tanner <whistles> shot him. So be creative, use a decoy. All right, it's 329, and I haven't stopped for questions. So I gotta give this decoy away, and I gotta answer any questions. There's no seminar behind, behind us, so we can sit here and. I can show you other videos, but right now I want to make sure that I fulfill my obligations of answering any questions you might have. Sir. Great, great question. What's the best place to research if I got a bunch of points for mule deer? I want to, you want to hunt? First of all, what's your expectations? What kind of buck do you want to, how many points do you have? Nine, okay. What kind of buck do you want to kill? Okay, a, 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 rep, a, a, a positive representative of the species. So let's put a 160 to 170 on there. I think that's doable in Colorado. Is it doable on nine points? Go hunt. Go to go hunt. The, and, and there might be a... Uh, uh, they have some things that for free, you might have to buy a subscription, but it's worth it. You can research every state, how many unit, uh, how many preference points it takes to draw in each unit, okay? It gives you a good estimation, okay? Talk to taxidermists, okay? In the area, okay? Become a member of the Colorado Bow Hunters Association and go to the banquet. Go to the RMEF. Go to the banquet. Get around other hunters. They're not going to give away stuff for free till you start to build the relationship. 
But most of the stuff I learn about areas, I learn from my friends or, or good buddies that are hunting buddies. And we might not even hunt together. But, you know, you're in a special place. Nine points is a lot of points. I would have no problem sharing information with you. I don't have nine points. I'm six years from having nine points. All right? We're not direct competition. Okay? See what I'm saying? Now, if I had nine points, I might not share much with you. But you see what I'm saying? So you just got to kind of go outside. But that's how you can find what units you can draw, and then you can start to research the trophy quality in that unit. It's pretty, would you guys agree it's pretty legit if, it, if a unit takes nine points to draw, you're probably going to have an opportunity at something. I mean, that's not a two-point unit. It's not a one-point unit. Those are the ones, even, even the three-point units, you're going to find more crowd. The crowds are going to get smaller and smaller. Okay? But you know what I like to do? I like to go into one of those units like I did with my buddy and kill a 170-inch buck. That was the only, only big buck we saw. But they're there. They're there. All right? They get pretty smart. Questions? Sir? Sure. What kind of terrain features are you looking for when you're e-scouting, specifically in the mountains? Well, north facing slopes. Why? Bedding area. Okay. If we're hunting a late season hunt, we're looking for south facing slopes. Okay. So what do, what do deer need? They need feed, prime forage, not just feed, prime forage, thermal cover, and water. Okay. Animals need all three of those things. So if I can limit, well, I always consider one other thing, and that's pressure. Whether that be wolves or humans, pressure is another factor. I'm looking for the limiting factor here, okay? If I go to Idaho and I'm looking for a great elk hunt, I'm probably not gonna hunt where there's a bunch of wolves, right? Or a unit where there's a bunch of people. But when I'm e-scouting, I'm looking for my scouting, I mean my glassing points first. But I want to be able to see those north facing slopes because in September, normally when I'm hunting mule deer in the high country, that's where they're bedding, okay? Because it's the shadiest, it's the coolest. The late season grasses are there, that's where I'm going to find my prime forage, okay? I don't mind rock outcrops. You'll find some good forage there and you'll also find some good shade. I mean, how many times have you seen an old buck go up right up to the base of a big old cliff in bed, right? right? Access. How many access points do I have there? Because I'm in Colorado, on public land, you're not just hunting the animal, you're also out there with everybody else, right? And, and we need to be aware of that and be cautious of that. So that's the first thing I'm, I'm doing. Then, when I get there, I'm not going up to my glassing spots to glass for deer. I'm going up to my glassing spot to glass for what can I see. Because I might get up there, it looked great on there, but I can't see crap because there's too much. So I need to maybe go, oh, may, let, me, let me go down here to this spot. Okay, now it opens up. They'll just verify. You don't want to be finding that first light, right? Because you need to be able to get on something because they're probably, especially early season, going to bed quickly. So you need to be glassing at that first light. So, you know, I use Google Earth all the time. He said, how reliant am I on Google Earth? I use Google Earth all the time. Understand that Google Earth updates over a period. You know, some of the areas that have had fires, you look at them, they don't look like they've had fires. So you have to, you know, it is what, what, it, what it is. It, they, they update it kind of in a rolling deal. Um, but I use it. What's that? Uh, I use Onyx, but they're, they're tying into a lot of Google imagery. So, Google's free. You know, Onyx for me, because of the other tools it has, is, I mean, and there's other Basecamp and some of these other, I've never used them, so I don't have any, uh, I assume they're similar. Um, Onyx is innovating and continuing to innovate. The 3D, I like their 3D thing because you know, it gives, the, it gives that, that feel, so, yeah. Other questions? Okay, let's do our giveaway, shall we? Thanks for watching Outback Outdoors. We encourage you to comment below, and as always, like, subscribe, and click the alert to stay up to date on all our new videos.